I know I've been promising you this video for a while. I've actually mentioned this book twice in both of my cuties videos and a lot of you seemed really interested in it. You're probably wondering what's taken me so long, but it's not an easy book to read. It takes a while to get through because every time you start reading, you get through a few pages, then you have to put it down and stare off into the void. And then you get through a few more pages and then you gotta pace around and wonder what's wrong with the world. Basically, it's one third reading, one third staring off into the void, and one third laying down in a fetal position, rocking back and forth, wondering where it all went wrong. So that's what happened. And that's why it's taken me so long to get this book review out. The author, her name is Nancy Jo Sales. She's a very accomplished journalist. She's written for Vanity Fair and Harper's Bazaar. She went across the country and interviewed hundreds of girls and some of their parents and some boys and some experts as well. She really did the legwork. That's why it's 385 pages. Every one of those pages is important. American Girls, Social Media and the Secret Lives of Teenagers is basically about what it's like to grow up now with social media, with all of your actions put online, with the school following you home. Girls spend so much time on social media and on their phones. It really shocks this author. You could see how much that shocked her. A lot of you watching won't be so surprised with what's in this book because I feel we were of the generation where this was either coming or this was already here. But the author is a baby boomer. So she hasn't been a teenager for a long, long time. It's clear she didn't grow up with a computer or anything like that. And I kind of appreciate her take on this because it seems so fresh. It seems like an outsider looking in. Now, let me tell you about this book. The span of teenage years is 13 through 19. So her chapter one is called 13 or chapter two is called 14, et cetera, et cetera. I don't see her really interviewing too many inner city girls or girls from specific communities. It's very mainstream who she chooses to interview. And I appreciate that because it is a book about mainstream American culture. Now she does point out, and I thought this was really interesting, that social media is the great equalizer. Like all girls from all cultures are looking at social media right now. Whether they're in the United States or in London or in South Korea, we're all kind of looking at the same social media and getting the same messages. So that's sort of a blanket media force over the whole world. That's new and that's really interesting because before we each used to be exposed to our different cultures. So chapter 13 starts with Sophie getting a request for nudes, spelled N-O-O-D-Z. Now, a lot of people in my last video, in my cuties review, got very upset that I suggested that girls would be asked for nudes but it's very common. Girls get asked for nudes all the time. I said that they should go online and find some random nude and send it and the guy will never know. I was kidding. I do not mean that. You should not just go find some random nude online. It was a joke. What you should do is when a guy asks you for nudes, you send them a Georgia O'Keeffe painting. And if he doesn't like it, well, he wasn't the guy for you to begin with because who doesn't appreciate a Georgia O'Keeffe painting? So I just wanna break down some of the things that I found really interesting about this book. There is a lot in here and I'm barely scratching the surface, but these particular things really stood out to me. I definitely suggest that you read it yourself because other things might stand out to you. And we should support authors because she clearly did a lot of work and wrote it very well. What the author points out, which I find really interesting, is that the hypersexualization of culture isn't just limited to young girls. It goes from 13 or 11, as we saw in Cuties, it goes from 11 all the way up to 50. The author points out one mother and daughter that were dressed pretty much the same. You know, in the cute little short shorts and a cute top and the hair done with the highlights and everything. And she wonders why mothers and daughters are dressing the same. And the girl answers, well, of course, everybody wants to be hot. I mean, I think that's pretty obvious. The girls even say that these mothers are watching The Real Housewives of Beverly Hills and they wanna look like that. Yeah, they do. Everybody wants to be hot. I don't know if that's an American thing or if that's a thing that just goes back in every culture at all times. Every woman wants to be beautiful her entire life. I don't know if beautiful always meant sexy, sexy, because it seems like in our culture and on social media, the women are impossibly sexy especially reality TV. Like why does everybody have to be hot all the time? Can't you be handsome or charming or pretty or elegant or beautiful? Like I feel that my grandmother's generation wanted to be beautiful, but they didn't want to go around constantly giving dudes boners. If they did, they were not open about it. 
That's a whole video for a whole nother day. It's funny that the author seems to learn some new vocabulary too. She says savages and boys. She's like, do you know what these things are? I'm like, yeah, I do know what they are. Before they were just called jerks. These are these kind of predatory fellas in the dating scene, the ones that'll talk you up, the ones that will date multiple girls. I mean, we've been warned about this for years and years and years. They just have a new platform now and a new way to reach out to all the girls. So the author was horrified to learn about savages and boys, but I think most of us already know what that is and to watch out for them. And they've been around. They've been around forever and ever. Maybe not in the same numbers that they're around now, but they're not new. Nancy Jo Sales also discusses the dress code debate. I feel the dress code debate is like a teenage version of the Free the Nipple campaign. Ali Wong has this great stand-up joke, which I'm just gonna butcher right now. But the idea is basically there are free the nipple feminists and there are stop child marriage feminists. And they are not the same. Now, you be whichever one you wanna be. I am personally a stop child marriage feminist but I can understand why the Free the Nipple campaign started and why it's out there. And I understand the dress code debate. The larger question is, does a dress code unfairly sexualize young girls or are young girls' bodies inherently sexual and therefore that's why the dress code is in place? What's notably not in this book is privacy or what's happening with all of our data. She touches on it a little bit, but it's not front and central because it is terrifying when she talks about how much information everybody is putting out online and the fact that that's just out there. It's beyond our control. It is out there to be used against us or not in the future. She seems to have just given up on the idea that anybody cares about privacy anymore. And I understand that. I completely understand that. It is so funny that the author seems to be shocked by this new big booty era that we're all in because obviously she came up before the big booty era where having a big booty was the worst thing you could have. She says things like, Nicki Minaj, that's the ideal body. Can you believe it? It's like, yeah, it's, it's been about that way for about 15 years now. One of the parts that I find really interesting in this book is sales breaks down the mean girls myth. We've all seen Mean Girls. It's a great movie about this really catty high school clique. It's sort of a next generation Heathers or Jawbreakers. And Sales points out that the evidence for this just isn't there. There was an article in 2005 from Newsweek that sort of got this hysteria all whipped up, but the Justice Department has since come out and said that they were just misinterpreting the information. So no, there aren't these mean girls out there. Of course there are mean girls, but there are toxic people in general. It's not just that girls are becoming meaner. And Sales sort of attributes this to victim blaming. Like if these girls are mean, then society can be mean to them too because they're not blameless. But that's a myth, that's a hoax. So th this myth is actually quite harmful. And this is the first time I've ever seen this broken down in a book before. However, you may notice that in reality TV, some of those girls act super ratchet. They get into fights and they pull hair and they throw glasses and all these things. I would just like to say that reality TV is fiction. They wait for the most interesting parts. A lot of the times the producers ply them up with alcohol to make them act worse than they normally would and then they select the most entertaining things and put that on screen. Sometimes they create a narrative out of thin air in the editing room. So you gotta be really careful what you see on reality TV and how much of that is actually real. If then girls go on to act the way they see in reality TV, is that art imitating life or life imitating art? I'm not quite sure there, but it is to be noted that reality TV is basically new. It's only like 20 years old. So we don't know the full effects of it yet. Another really interesting thing in the book, Sales explains how online interactions make conversation seem less real. It makes people seem less real. They're just sort of a voice in the box, in the phone box, kind of like series of voice in the phone box. Is she real? Is the person you're talking to real? Do they have real feelings? A lot of people have been exploring this recently. We all need to understand that the people on the other end of the phone are real people and they do have emotions. Sale seems really surprised by hookup culture. I don't think she grew up with it and I don't really think she's seen anything like it. She seems kind of horrified. There's also this kind of trend now in dating where there's a lot of messaging and then you go straight to hooking up without having the real dating part. This is what Sales notes in her book. So there is a lack of intimacy. And I see what she's saying with the messaging. 
Like it's really important to be able to have a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody, especially somebody you're interested in. The art of conversation can easily get lost if you're not using it. Sales worries that it's kind of getting lost in this generation because they're just texting so much. They're not having face-to-face -face conversations. And when you're texting with somebody, you can't really see their tone, their expression, their body language. It's really hard to make out what they're really trying to say to you. I just thought that was interesting. I, I wanna do a deep dive on that later. Also on hookup culture, Sales interviews this man named Dan and he describes online dating as basically Grubhub. You swipe, you order your food, and then that's it. That's how disposable people are. It's like, do I want a calzone tonight or do I want a redhead? And that really upset me because it felt like he was trivializing food. Like food is really important. You're literally putting it into your body so it can become a part of your cells. So to just compare it to something as cheap as online dating, I don't think she had to go there. And now we pick a mate from our phones. It gives people the impression that there are just a million potential matches out there and that you can judge them based on the photo that you see. So people don't wanna settle and they want somebody more attractive and they think more attractive means a better photo. So all of these things could not be more wrong. Personality is most of dating. Most of being in a relationship is whether the two of you can be friends. So you can't tell that from a picture. You can't even tell what a person looks like from the picture, if we're gonna be perfectly honest. Sales is very critical of online dating. I also have to say that everybody I know is in a relationship, either from online dating or for sliding into somebody else's DMs. So the best relationships and the strongest relationships I know started that way. So I can't be that critical of online dating. One of the funniest parts of the book, I'm sorry, is that the author is completely shocked absolutely shocked to find that young men are willing to receive oral sex from women they barely know. The horror. I kind of mentioned this in my cuties video about how these young girls were watching pornography over their phone and Nancy Jo Sales kind of points out the same thing and I find that really troubling because it sets unfair expectations. Now, it's not just that girls shouldn't be expected to perform as porn stars. Of course not, that's not it. But pornography always ends in a hookup. I think we should redo pornography. Hear me out, because I have a solution to all of this. The movie's like an hour, let's say it's an hour. But the first half an hour is just a date that goes really, really badly. Like nothing happens, there's no chemistry, they don't like each other. So they both go back to their respective houses and do whatever by themselves. You will have to watch the first half hour too. You have to watch the whole bad date. Now towards the end of the book, towards chapter 18, we see a lot of girls getting wise to the social media trap, that it's not real, that it's fake, that it doesn't necessarily influence their day-to-day -day lives outside of school. The author highlights Asina O'Neill, who is the model who rejected social media and tried to get everybody to look twice at it and look twice at their behavior. A lot of people came at her really hard for having done this. But think about it. If someone tries to get people off of drugs, what does the gang do to them? It's the same way. There's a lot of money in social media. So when she came and said it was hurting people, well, they can't have that. They can't have that narrative out there. She's gonna cost them money. So of course they attacked her personally. So in summary, I thought this was a very good book. It's a bit of a long read, like I said before. You're not gonna be able to digest it all at once. You're gonna have to cry a little bit and then digest a little bit more, but that's okay. You'll still learn a lot. I feel that the author, Nancy Jo Sales, just wasn't expecting this. I really do think that she came into it thinking like, oh, I'm gonna make a nice book. I'm gonna learn about girls and how they are now. And this is gonna be really sweet. I think this book may have ruined her, but it is really interesting that she is coming at it from such a different generation because I feel that millennials already know what's up. We saw this in the works. We kind of already knew how things were gonna go down. She's a few years separated from this whole trend, which kind of started in the late 90s and has just steamrolled since then. It's just kind of gotten out of hand. I feel that her take on it was very fresh because she hadn't grown up with it. I think the rest of us are like a frog sitting in water and the water is getting hotter and hotter, but we don't even notice it because it's just like, oh yeah, that's the water. That's the temperature of the water. And she's coming into it from the outside being like, oh, this is really hot water, guys. Look what we're in. And the rest of us are like, oh yeah, yeah. So yeah, 
That's my review of the book. It's a great book. Read it if you're a teenager and you don't see that you're in the matrix. This will help you see the matrix a lot better. Also, if you have a niece or a daughter that's around this age, this book might be really helpful to you. Or if you just wanna learn about what's going on. Definitely a good book. I thoroughly hated every page of it, but I enjoyed it. Does that make sense? Subscribe.